So if you guys will remember back to kickoff night, we were talking about the purpose of Wednesday nights. We were encouraging you guys into bigger, bolder things like bold prayers, being bold in unity, developing our spiritual gifts, identifying some five-fold ministry leaders out here, and of course, always experiencing the full status of our sonships as sons and daughters of the most living high God, right? And if you know me and Ryan, you know that's all we ever talk about. It's our favorite topic. But how many of you guys know sometimes you have to clean house? You got to sweep, you got to get rid of your garbage, take out the trash, get in your attic in your basement for all that junk that's accumulated. Ryan and I are in the middle of moving and remodeling, so we're like face-to-face -face with all our junk. Like, why do we still have this box here? Let's just keep moving it around. But in our hearts, we're not supposed to do that, keep moving and shuffling our junk around. We got to get rid of it, okay? So that's what we're doing tonight. We're going to be talking about guilt, shame, and condemnation. Blech. So get that junk out of the way so that later on we can get to that kingdom stuff, that good stuff. Not that tonight what we have for you isn't good, but some of it is kind of tough. Last week we talked about rejection, and that was a good night, wasn't that? And I hope that we have another good, awesome uh, experience tonight where we can loose those things and bind up that peace and love that Jesus has for us that he paid so much for, right? And so the kingdom of God is for all of us, right? It's not just for perfect people. Who's perfect? Who's going to the kingdom of God? I'm a worker for the Lord. No, it would be empty. So that's why all of us have some junk. Even though we're sinners saved by grace, we don't want to stay that sinner saved by grace, who we were when we came to the foot of the cross. That was just the you're hired moment, the moment that we signed our job contract. That was just that first beginning of salvation. We weren't immediately, we had access to the power of the blood of Jesus, but it wasn't all done. And of course, we have work on ourselves, on others, and always the mission of the Great Commission, right? And so I don't think what we're supposed to be doing is always working on ourselves, right? A lot of times, you know, in the world, people are, you know, self-care, they're working on themselves. And in believers, especially in uh, when we have keys to these kinds of things, we know about deliverance prayer, we know about rebuking the enemy. Sometimes we can spend a lot of time working on ourselves. And so there's a danger there. We don't want to totally focus on just that, right? Just ourselves. But we also don't want to completely neglect ourselves either. Because then your arms are so full of carrying your junk around in the kingdom that they're not free to help out, right? We know Luke 10 too. We know that the harvest is great, but the workers are few. So pray to the Lord who is in charge of the harvest. Ask him to send more workers into his fields. And so tonight, fellow kingdom workers, let's get ready to get to work. So those issues, guilt, shame, and condemnation, we're going to look at the devil's playbook to get to the bottom of this. And so again, if you know Ryan and I, you might know that we don't really like talking about the devil or his plans. We know somebody so much more important and interesting, right? But tonight, as we look at his playbook... We are going to see what he's doing so that we, like 2 Corinthians 2.11, are not ignorant of his devices so that we would be outsmarted or that he would take advantage of us. We don't want that, right? So as we look at his playbook, don't be too impressed because we know the whole first chapter is like how to be the dumbest angel ever and get kicked out of heaven. We're not impressed by the devil's work. So we're going to focus on chapter 2. The devil's schemes to make mankind feel inescapable guilt, shame, and condemnation. Because it affects us all, whether we're saved or backsliding or whether we're still an unbeliever. So I'm going to talk about guilt and shame. Ryan's going to follow up with condemnation. We're going to pray deliverance prayers. And then we're going to do a prophetic act of faith with this water that you see up here. All right, so guilt. Guilt is how we feel about things that we have done that are sinful or immoral or wrong, stuff we've been involved with we know we shouldn't be. And guilt is normal. That's a healthy part of our honest response of our conscience, okay? It's better to feel guilt and know we've done right and wrong than to have no conscience at all. And how many of you know that that's the goal the devil's working toward in the world? He says, do what thou wilt. All paths lead to the same place, so it doesn't really matter what you do. Your truth is different than my truth. All of those are lies with one intention, 
to sever our conscience. Because we know the word says that at some point, the Lord, he's holding us on that leash, you know, that yeast, that, that salt. And then at some point, he will turn us over to our will and we lose that conscience. We lose that right and wrong, that guilt. But here's where guilt kind of takes a turn off the main road and gets into the weeds, is when we are forgiven and still carry that guilt. That's what we're going to talk about tonight, that kind of guilt. Um, and we know all of this happens in the supernatural, spiritual realm. That's the terrain that guilt and shame and condemnation happens. And so that is where we're going to deal with it, is in that spiritual realm. Again, this isn't a self-help night. We're talking about spiritual stuff because that's what our Father is, is spirit, where he accomplishes that work. And so both of those we're going to address tonight in the deliverance prayer and in our prophetic act. So that's guilt. And then shame is different in guilt and condemnation in that those deal with how we feel about things we've done. But shame deals with how we feel about ourselves our identity, our worth. And some of us have been programmed for shame from our earliest memories, right? Spoken words like, you should be ashamed of yourself or shame on you. Those are things we say to children. Are those not literal word curses? And some of us have picked up shame along the way, never having been cleansed for wrongdoing or never fully believing that the redemptive work of Jesus actually worked. For us. And so it's hell's plan to weigh us down with shame so that our identity gets so mucky that we couldn't even believe, couldn't even have room for the love of a Father God and His children, of our Savior and that bride church. Here are four things that Satan hopes will grow inside of us. Number one, hell wants us to feel that we are different from others, that we don't really belong. Number two, hell wants us to feel that we are bad and that that badness is unredeemable. If any of us have been abused or injured or violated in our lifetimes, the devil uses this to make us believe that we are dirty. Number three, hell wants us to then cover that shame by making us hide from other people, thinking if they really knew what kind of person I am. And number four, God, hell, not God, wants us to hide from God like Adam and Eve did in the beginning. If any of these have made it into our personal belief system, unfortunately, they're probably going to accomplish a lot. They don't just sit there and do nothing. They sit there and they turn bad seeds and bad stuff into us, okay? And so 1 John 1, 7 talks about one of the things that it's going to accomplish, which is going to be separating us from real fellowship with one another. 1 John 1, 7 says, But if we are living in the light as God is in the light, then we will have fellowship with each other, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Last week we talked about this need for fellowship in not rejecting others, not being fearful of being rejected, and of course not forsaking the gathering. Thank you guys for being here tonight. <laughs> But when we have shame, it makes it so much more difficult to be vulnerable and able to be freely known by others. That shame makes that almost impossible. And so in order to be good workers of the kingdom, that's some of the junk we have to get rid of to remove this blockage. The other thing that will be accomplished when we have embraced shame in our hearts is that we will be blocked from coming openly face to face before our Father. And God wants to be face-to-face -face with you. Whether you spend time in his presence every day, he wants more. Whether you knew him as a little child, but you walked away, he wants you back. Whether you doubt him all the time, you don't understand, he wants your trust. Or whether you're walking and living in the life of a prodigal right now, eating with the pigs, feeling that tug to come home, he wants to run and meet you on the road. He wants to lift your face, embrace you, put on a robe of righteousness, and to honor you more than you deserve, more than you've earned. God has wanted our affection and our face-to-face -face friendship from the very beginning. He told Moses 
way back when, to tell Aaron how to bless his people with the, with the original Hebrew priesthood. That blessing is recorded in Numbers chapter 6. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to Aaron and his sons, saying, This is the way you shall bless the children of Israel. Say to them, The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you peace. So they shall put my name on the children of Israel, and I will bless them. I want to talk about something interesting here. The Lord's name is recorded as the Holy Tetragrammation. For anyone who doesn't know what that is, those are the four letters used to write the personal name of God. At the burning bush, he revealed it to Moses for the first time in human history, and he spoke out his personal name. And so in English, the four letters we use to transliterate God's name are Y-W-A-H. The four Hebrew letters are yud Hey, Vav, Hey. And the ancient Hebrew language that the Old Testament was written in didn't have vowels, so we don't know for sure how that would sound pronounced or said out loud. But Yahweh is what it's believed to be. You may have heard Jehovah before. And the Jews don't even say his personal name out loud for fear of saying it in vain and being cursed like spoken of in Leviticus. And their scripture substitutes yud He vav He as Adonai, or Lord. And so today, you're probably reading from your phone, but a written version of scripture with the tetragrammation translated as Lord, L-O-R-D in capital letters. Okay, so what's my point in giving you this little history lesson tidbit, besides that it's fun for teachers like me, is my point that Is the name of the Lord allowed to be said? Is it Yahweh? Is it Jehovah? No, none of those things are my point. My point is that when God gave this blessing to be spoken over the children of Israel, he uses his personal name. This high blessing comes from the personal, face-to-face, name-to-name God. From Yahweh, from yud heh vav this kindness, this openness that he displays to us, do you want to hide your face from that, hanging on to shame? He will blot out our sins and take that darkness away. He will embrace us. And then on top of that, he gives a blessing onto us, just like the children of Israel. Micah seven nineteen. Once again, you will have compassion on us. You will trample our sins under your feet and throw them into the depths of the ocean. That's like pretty dramatic language that God's trying to get into our minds. I do not remember your sin. I do not hold your sin against you when you're forgiven. Into the depths of the ocean. Over and over he uses that language. He is so passionate about us looking at him freely, turning our face to him. In the Old Testament especially, we read all kinds of things. It talks about his countenance or our face or lifter of our heads. And we don't really talk like that today. But when you think about how open that is, how kind that is for God to lift our face into the light of him, how can we shy away from that? 2 Corinthians 3.17, For the Lord is the Spirit, and wherever the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And yet when there is shame that we've held on to in our hearts, for whatever reason, be it our own obstinacy or demonic oppression, when that shame is there, we are forfeiting this beautiful, free life that he has offered us. Forfeiting it. And there's only limited real estate in our souls, guys. What I mean by that is that you cannot have shame mostly taken care of, but in the back corner of your soul, and also be fully available to the Spirit. Limited real estate. And God doesn't want us living that way. Jesus, our Messiah, Savior, paid too much. It was too costly for us to dance that line. That line where when I'm good, I'm, I'm there, I'm at church, I'm praying. I'm maybe even praying for other people. I'm out there, I'm going to go on missions. But then when I mess up, when I stumble, 
You know, I kind of go back like that. How many, how many of you know that that's a cycle? Goes around and around and around. Too costly did he pay for that exact chain to be broken. And that's what we're inviting you toward tonight, to break that chain. The Holy Spirit holds our hands to guide us through this, doesn't he? We don't just have to read every book we can find, watch every YouTube we can find. We listen to the Holy Spirit. We know his voice. The whole reason he was sent to us is to guide us into this place of experiencing our full sonship, our full daughtership with the Father, unhindered and unblocked. Jesus is that way. Yeshua HaMashiach. He is the way, the truth, and the life, and the Spirit brings us into his presence. Every time you mess up and stumble, the Holy Spirit goes, take my hand, we're going back. If we had it our way, we would go hide, right? I don't know where I got this image, but I would always imagine God like a big mattress below me. And that I could just let go and fall. And you, you don't, you know what it's like to fall. You don't want to let go. You're looking, you're holding on. But I would say, I know that I know that I know he's going to be there to catch me. And in my heart, I would just fall back on him. And every time that mattress, that soft boom, it's, it's firm, right? A mattress isn't just, you know, like a ball pit where you're like, ah. It's a firm place, but it's soft. I've always imagined that place as the, when I mess up, where I can go back to. You know, he doesn't take it out at the last minute and saying, well, that one, that sin was too far. No, he's always there. And so shouldn't we be willing to try to lean in a little farther to believe he is able and willing to deliver us? Shouldn't we open ourselves up and be vulnerable to him? I'd love to read you guys a testimony about this breakthrough from guilt and shame. This comes from a Christian counseling ministry called Above and Beyond, and the writer's name is Donald. He writes about the exact kind of torment that hidden shame world creates and that exact kind of breakthrough that Jesus offers. And so I'm going to read it to you now. Donald writes, I've been a born-again believer in the Lord Jesus Christ for over 20 years. For many of those years, I have been active in various church leadership roles. I loved God spent time in the scriptures and prayer daily, most days, tithed, and have done some missions work. But I could only seem to get so far in my spiritual life. I'd be cruising along in a measure of happiness, kind of like on a warm, sunny day. Then something would happen. It's as if a thick chain would get wrapped around my waist and would pull me backward as a prisoner into a dark cave of loneliness, unworthiness, self-loathing, shame, and emotional defeat. There in the cave, I'd be subjected to what felt like incessant condemning and suicidal thoughts. It was like loud tapes playing that could not be stopped. I'd lose momentum and end up just numbly going through the motions trying to hold things together in my life. After a while, thank God, I'd be reminded of the light at the mouth of the cave. I knew if I held on, things would improve and I could get there again. So I'd pray and repent, and things would get better for a while. It was a horrible cycle, and it played out again and again over the years until four months ago. Through a men's scripture study of Luke 4, 17 through 19 at that time, and through the confirmation of a spirit-filled brother, I learned that believers can be demonically oppressed. The brother recommended contacting above and beyond, and I did so that day. Their teaching and ministry process were true revelation to me. Today, God's word has been appropriated over me in this, and I am free. The chain has been broken, and the tapes no longer play. I feel like God has all the territory of my soul to work with now because it is occupied only by his loving spirit of righteousness, peace, and joy. My spirit is clearer, and I sense God's presence and power more than ever. Also, I no longer fear the cave because you taught me how to stay free in Christ Jesus. I can go on and on about this new life, but I'll end by saying it's like being awakened to a wide awake state and almost everyone else is sleepy or asleep. You just want them to wake up so they too can live in the new thing God has for them. What a testimony. Don't you want to meet Donald? I don't know what state he lives in, but 
That's someone who, I mean, his story is familiar to all of us. Whether it's something that we have those chains, like he has that demonic you know, oppression that he went through. But all of us experience that in some way. Feeling whether or not we're worthy enough to lift our faces to God. But uh, he gives a great testimony. I'm glad that I found that and was able to share that with you guys. And so many of us have that testimony too, I'm sure, here that could share. And we want more of that testimony. We want more Donalds here in the Silver Valley and in this midst. He's talking about abundant life. And something that he said really jumped out at me. He wrote that he feels like God has all the territory of his soul to work with now. We might be living victoriously for the most part. But how many of you know that God is a jealous God? Is there any territory of your soul that isn't open and available to him? That's kept in the back part? Or if you're living a prodigal life right now, is there anything out there that measures up that is as good as his peace, his power, his abiding love, and his acceptance in here? No way. Nothing. And so that face-to-face -face personal God calls to you tonight. We're dealing with our junk, guilt, shame. And Ryan's going to deal with condemnation or invite you to deal with your condemnation. And so before he comes up here, I'd like to pray, okay? Lord, our Heavenly Father, our good, good King Jesus, thank you for paying everything so that we can come boldly. Lord, that we don't have to live under condemnation, under guilt and shame anymore. Seal this in our hearts, and Lord, anoint Ryan as he comes to bring us our word and prepare our hearts to go through these deliverance prayers. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, I'm going to jump into condemnation, right? And I have three goals that I want to talk to you tonight. One, I want to talk to the non-believer, the one who feels like they're out there by themselves. They've never heard this. They've only lived under their condemnation. That's all they know. Also, second goal, I want to talk to the believers in this room, those that know their Lord and Savior but still are holding on to that self-condemnation. They haven't laid it at the feet of Jesus, but at the base of the cross. And then, of course, you guys know me. I want to build our faith. It's a battle cry. We're going to do that through our declaration. We're going to do that by washing our hands, washing our face. But I want you to remember tonight that the joy of the Lord is our what? Strength. strength. The joy of the Lord is our strength. And what does Jesus require when you're reading through uh, the the Gospels, what's he always ask for? Faith. Do you have faith to be healed? So I ask you, do you have faith to see the victory to removing the evil spirit of condemnation from your life? But first, what is condemnation? I would say it's the accusing voice enemy that's telling us that we're unworthy or we're bad. You know, when the Lord has opened my eyes at times, I see the enemy as kind of a dark, cloudy spirit or figure of a person. I know other people, um, when we're actually down in Fort Hall tribe, tribe members would see it actually as a glowing uh, orb or, or ball. I've heard testimonies that people would see the enemy in different ways, some with long, greasy black hair. I share this because I want you guys to picture in your mind who you're dealing with when it comes to speaking things like, you're unworthy. You're no good. You're bad. That's condemnation. That's a spirit. That's who is speaking into you. And when the Lord has opened my eyes, that's what I see and who is speaking into my ear. But you know what? You have no, more power over hell in your little pinky fingernail than all of hell. But also understand the Bible says non believers do live in condemnation. But once saved, we no longer have condemnation in Christ, right? Jesus said that? Yeah, but Ryan, I'm a sinner saved by grace. Yes, true. But you're one of his holy ones. Don't cling to your identity as a sinner, but as a child of God, free of condemnation. Amen? Amen. In my eyes, you surrender, you get saved, and you get to work. You get to work for the kingdom. Satan hates this. It's the job of the enemy to keep God's 
people under the thumb of condemnation. He wants to keep us in chains wrapped around us to keep us feeling heavy and not free to do the things that we are called to do. And that looks different for many people, but no, it all starts with that condemnation. I'm not good enough. I'm not worthy enough. But let's look at what Jesus said in John 5, 24. He says in red letters, I speak to you an internal truth. If you embrace my message and believe in the one who sent me, you will never face condemnation. For in me, you have already passed from the realm of death into the realm of eternal life. Right? Jesus is calling us to believe in the God and our Father and believe his promise that we will never, say never, never face condemnation. As believers, if we embrace condemnation, then we are calling Jesus a liar. Let me say that again. As believers, if we embrace, hug, hold on to condemnation, then you're looking at Jesus and saying, I don't believe you. Right? Kind of a big deal. But he said, you will never face, that means never, not at all, not even once, face condemnation. So lay it on the foot of the cross. What about those who don't know Jesus? We all have them, our neighbors. Those who are going through this life alone, one struggling through the accusing voices of the enemy, the same enemy I explained to you. This is what the Bible says to them. It says to you, John 3, 18. So now there is no longer any condemnation for those who believe in him. But the unbeliever already lives under condemnation because they do not believe in the name of God's beloved son. If you feel like I'm speaking to you, then know this. Jesus loves you. And the word says that if you but call on the name of our Lord, you will be saved and you'll be free from all condemnation. Amen? I don't know what the enemy is speaking to you. And in everyone's walk of life, I don't know what condemnation you've had to live under. But know, and I can say this as a promise based on the word of God, that when you call on the name of the Lord, you will be saved. You will be free. Romans 5.18. In other words, just as condemnation came upon all people through one transgression, so through one righteous act of Jesus' sacrifice, the perfect righteousness that makes us right with God and leads us to victorious life is now available to all. The Father loves you. He loves all of you. If you feel like Jesus is knocking on the door of your heart, then please let him in. Let him in. Receive his love and lay the guilt, shame, and condemnation at the feet of Jesus. But church, what? Christ does not want to return to a bride wearing the tattered, dirty dress of guilt, shame, and condemnation. Christ wants to return to the Bride without stain or wrinkle, standing ready, holy, without blemish, lamp stands in hand and lit. That is who he wants to return to. Scripture reminds us verse after verse that we have no condemnation through Christ. None, not at all. So let's look at a few verses. And of course, right now, Romans is mine and Rachel's favorite book. So I'm going to read all three of these verses from Romans. But let's turn to uh, verse, let's see, chapter 8, verse 1. So now the case is closed. There remains no accusing voice of condemnation, condemnation against those who are joined in life union with Jesus, the anointed one. Amen. Romans 5, 9. And since we have been made right in God's sight by the blood of Christ, he will certainly save us from God's condemnation. And Romans five sixteen, When the result of God's gracious gift is very different from the results of of that one man's sin. From Adam's sin led to condemnation, but God's free gift leads to our being made right with God, even though we are guilty of many sins. Church, we once had condemnation through the old law, but because of God's free gift, because of Christ, we have no more condemnation. None, it's gone. Forever, say forever. Brothers and sisters, if you feel like you have that weighing on your soul, 
you feel like that weight of guilt, shame, and condemnation is just weighing you down, holding you back, then release it. Let it go. And we will, as we declare out and repent of that tonight, we will release that from us. There is no need to let it hold you back. When Rachel and I were preparing our message, we uh, were sitting in our basement and we're on our couches, you know, laptops are sitting in front of us and Mariah is running around playing with her toys. And of course she has the TV on with Disney cartoon Robin Hood. You guys know what I'm talking about when I say that? The old Disney cartoon Robin Hood. Well, there's a character in there that plays Little John. Okay, and there's that little character that plays the snake. I don't know what his name is. But at one point I thought was really funny and quite fitting. And he, he holds that snake up and he says, uh, let's see if I get this right. Get lost, creepy. Be gone, long one. Right? So I want to say this to you. Have that same humor, that same joy, and look in the face of the enemy and say, get lost, creepy. Be gone, long one. Right? You have that power because of Jesus. Look in the eyes of the enemy that's saying you're not worthy and say, get lost, creepy. You guys are going to have nightmares now hearing my voice saying, get lost, creepy. Right? I want to look at the man who tackled his sin head on. I want to use him as an example. A man who was exposed of his sin, but he still went to the throne of God to repent immediately. In that moment, he didn't confuse conviction with condemnation. So I want to end tonight with conviction versus condemnation, and then we'll jump into our prayer. So I want to look at King David. So turn in your Bible to 2 Samuel chapter 12. I don't have it on the screen above us because I'm going to be reading through verses 1 through 14. That's a lot of reading, a lot of slides. So verse 1, when the Lord sent Nathan to David, and he came to him and said to him, I'm sorry, let me pause right there. When I was prepping to read through uh, this whole section, I was first reading out of the NLT translation. I often go there, the Passion Translation. But I have to say, when, when I'm about to read, I w- kind of got the atmosphere that Nathan came in and sat next to David and said, we need to talk. More intimate. That's kind of what I figured from just reading NLT. But then I got to thinking, no, I'm going to go into Strong's, and I'm, I'm going to look with the original Hebrew text. What kind of atmosphere did it set for that, going to the original language? And let me tell you, my, my mind changed because it wasn't an intimate. It was, David, David, Nathan, we need to talk. We need to talk because there's two men. There's two men in your kingdom. It was a sense of urgency. And he needed to talk to David right now. It wasn't intimate. There's nothing intimate about it. He was there to tell about something awful that happened. So I bring you through that because I want you to picture Nathan, the prophet, running through those doors back there and saying, David, there's two men. Two men, David. We got to talk. Okay? Guys fallen? He said, there were two men in the city, one rich and one poor, The rich man had exceedingly many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing except one little ewe lamb, which he had bought and nourished. And it grew up together with him and with his children. It ate of his own food and drank from his own cup and lay in his bosom. It was like a daughter to him. And a traveler came to the rich man who refused to take from his own flock and from his own herd to prepare one for the wayfaring man who had come to to him. But he took the poor man's lamb and prepared it for the man who had come to him. So David's anger was greatly aroused against the man and said to Nathan, as the Lord lives, and what's here? It's actually yud heh vav heh. As Yahweh lives, the man who has done this shall surely die, and he shall restore fourfold for the lamb because he did this thing and because he had no pity. Then Nathan said to David, you are that man. You are that man. Remember, urgency. Thus says the Lord Yahweh, God of Israel, 
I anointed you king over Israel, and I delivered you from the hand of Saul. I gave you your master's household and your master's wives into your keeping, and you gave, and gave you the house of Israel and Judah. And if that had not been too little, I also would have given you much more. Why have you despised the commandment of the Lord to do evil in his sight? You have killed Uriah the Hittite with the sword. You have taken his wife to be your wife, and you have killed him with the sword of the people of Ammon. Now therefore the sword shall never depart from your house, because you have despised me, and have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. Thus says the Lord, Behold, I will rise up adversary against you from your own house, and I will take your wives before your eyes and give them to your, your neighbor, and he shall lie with your wives in the sight of the sun, or in broad daylight. For you have done, for you did in, sorry, you did it secretly, but I will do this thing before all Israel, before the sun. So David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. Now that's important. It's very important. Immediately he repented. And Nathan said to David, the Lord also has put away your sin and you shall not die. Compassion. However, because by this deed you have given great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme, the child also who is born to you shall surely die. Okay, I'm going to get in the weeds a little bit here off my main point, but I want to talk about that last verse, verse 14. And when you actually, again, go back into the Hebrew, I want to rephrase how it is said there to make it a little more understandable. I read it as, however, because by the deed you have partnered with the enemy to show Yahweh great contempt, your child shall die. That was David's great sin. He partnered with the enemy to show God contempt. It's a big deal. It's a big deal. Again, a little bit on a rabbit trail, but I just thought it was very important to share that. It's also important to share, go into different translations and look at the original text. But what I do want you guys to take from this is David represents the believer who has stumbled. He represents us, okay? And Nathan represents the Holy Spirit. We might read this and immediately think that Nathan comes to accuse and condemn David. But what does the Holy Spirit do for us? The Holy Spirit shines a light on our sins to expose our darkness not to tear us down, but to save us from it, right? He wants to expose it to save us. That is conviction. To me, that's the definition of conviction versus condemnation. Conviction brings with hope of repentance and life. Nathan, representing the Holy Spirit, brings correction with hope, right? Correct? You guys following? Remember, condemnation comes from Satan and offers no way out. So church, I say this. Throw off, throw off condemnation. Repent of the conviction that the Holy Spirit has laid on your life. And then return back before the throne of God in worship and joy. Jump right back before him and say, Lord God, I praise you. Lord God, I love you. Thank you for forgiving me. I ignore the enemy and the words of condemnation, but I receive the conviction that the Holy Spirit has laid on my life. Right? That is why I wanted to highlight David's response. He confesses his sin to Nathan, threw himself on the floor before God in repentance. He also bore the earthly consequence of his sin because his son did die. But then it says in verse 20, then David got up from the ground, washed himself, put on lotions, and changed his clothes. He went to the tabernacle and worshiped the Lord. After that, he returned to his palace and was served and ate food. That's important. Why? Because when we sin or we stumble, use David as that model. Repent immediately. Repent immediately. Bathe. Clothe yourself. Comb your hair. This is, says, if you're fasting, comb your hair and do let others know. Comb your hair and return back and present yourself to the Father and say, I worship you. I love you. I sinned. I repent. And I want to move forward for the kingdom work you have placed in me.
Every one of you has a job to do in the kingdom. Every one of you has a job. And I know that when I'm partnered with my brothers and sisters, that job gets done faster. It's done that much more faster because when we're combined together as one body, we advance the kingdom of God. Amen. Rachel and I were talking before. I'll try and put this in words because it's not in my notes. Kind of felt like, oh, condemnation's talked about. It's talked about before. What am I really going to share? But you know what? It's often believed within the church that we're to bear condemnation. I'm a sinner. No, you're a child of God. You're one of his holy ones. You laid that at the foot of the cross. You laid it. It's gone. It's forgotten. Erased. Forevermore. And when you leave that at the foot of the cross, then you can advance the kingdom of God to do the work he has called you to do. Amen. Awesome. We're going to go ahead and jump into our prayer. So grab your sheet of paper. I'm actually going to have you guys stand again. I like it when you guys stand. Feel the presence of the Holy Spirit. If you feel led, raise your hands and just declare this to heaven. Let's make the valley shake. Let's make the enemy shake. If it helps, think about you're just looking into the eyes of Satan saying, be gone. I think I've shared before, Smith Wigglesworth was woken up in the middle of the night. Satan standing, Satan himself, standing at the foot of his bed, wakes up, looks at him and says, oh, it's only you. Rolls back around, and goes back to sleep. I pray, church, that we are all like that. Amen? I want all of you to wake up in the middle of the night, feel that shiver of the enemy trying to attack you and say, oh, it's only you. Be gone, creepy. Be gone, long one. Right? Can you imagine how unstoppable we will be if we just rolled over and said, I rebuke you. Be gone, Satan. I have more important things to do. I have love to share with my neighbors. I have compassion to share. I don't want to be in the weeds with you. You're distracting me. Right? Let's keep on talking. I got those Pentecostal uh, shivers going down my spine. Okay. All right. Hallelujah. It's outside my comfort zone. You, you know the spirit's moving when I'm talking this much, right? Just ask Rachel. It's quiet at our household. She's just over in the corner talking to herself. I'm just nodding. All right. Father God. I repent of doubting your love for me. I repent of not believing that you have really forgiven me and that the blood of Jesus has cleansed me from all the sin, all the guilt, all the shame of my past, of all the things I have done and of all the things that have happened to me. I repent of agreeing with hell and believing the voice of guilt, shame and condemnation. I repent of believing the lie that I am less worthy than others or that I don't belong. I break all agreements I have made with the lying voices of guilt, shame, and condemnation. I break all soul ties and every generational tie that would bind me in any way to guilt and shame. In Jesus' name, I break every curse and hex and every vow and covenant, every spell and incantation that would give shame any power in my life. I renounce all guilt, shame, and condemnation. I renounce guilt, shame, and con of the work of the enemies designed to rob me, the joy of open relationship with God and with people. I renounce these as a tool of hell to keep me from being 
becoming the person God created me to be. I choose today to be free of guilt, shame, and condemnation. I choose to receive cleansing and full release from all the shame in my heart and in my life according to your word. Father God, I open my heart right now to receive your unconditional love and your full forgiveness. I let go of all guilt, shame, and condemnation in my life. I let go of everything I have done and everything that has happened to me. In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen. Hallelujah, exactly. Wonderful. Do you receive it? Amen. I receive it. So important that we voice for heaven to write down in the record book that you received it. You are free. You are free when you accepted Jesus at the cross. But like Rachel said, we need to get rid of those cobwebs. Believe in the power of your tongue. Read through James. If you deny the power of your tongue, read through James. And that we prayed, I'll tell you guys what's going on with this water up here. I'm gonna have uh, Rach and uh, Warren, join. have you guys come up here and you guys will just kind of form two lines. And what we're gonna do is you'll come up here and you'll have one of them pour water over your hands, okay? And when that water is being poured over your hands, I want you to think back to the guilt that you have had in your life. I want you to think back to things that have been done or operated by the, your hands, the work that's been done. And let it be washed off and cleansed. Why water? Historically, throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament, water was used for both of these purposes, cleansing and healing. Say cleansing and healing. 2 Kings 5, Elisha tells Naaman to go and dip seven times. He was reluctant, but he went and he was completely healed of leprosy. Completely healed. John chapter 9, Jesus spits in the mud, creates a little bolus, puts it in the eyes of a blind man and tells him, go wash in the pool of Shalom and there you'll be healed. He came back healed completely. That's why water that is why, because it's an action in the physical realm that releases results in the spiritual realm. You've heard us say this before, over and over again. Action in the physical realm that releases results in the spiritual realm. This isn't magic water. There's nothing mystic about this. It's just regular old tap water, okay? But we're using this as an act, an action in the physical that you watch will change things for you in the spiritual Amen? So like Jesus said, let it be unto you according to your faith. After you get water poured over your hands as you walk away, just like it talks about shame being a veil that covers our face and blocks us to be able to commune with our Lord face to face, take that water still in your hands and just wipe it on your face, okay? Ladies, I know you have makeup, but for this act, it'll be okay. I was supposed to say that. I don't know if it came out PC, but. But in that moment, be thinking about that veil being removed from your eyes. You can commune with your Lord and Savior face to face. Face to face. And then grab a paper towel and you can go back to your seat and be seated. In that moment, though, be rejoicing and thankful for, to the Lord for removing, say removing, Amen. guilt, shame, and condemnation. Amen? All right. You guys can go ahead and start coming up here and they'll pour water over your hands. You can put it over your face. I shared earlier on what the enemy looks like when the Lord has opened my eyes. But I want to share to you what our Father looks like when he opened my eyes. I think I've shared this before. But I want you to close your eyes right now. I'm trying to share this without crying on you. Lord God lifted me up. I was in the palm of his hand. And I looked square into his eyes. 
Let me tell you, his white, wavy hair was alive. Alive and singing his praises. Beautiful white beard. And his eyes, for as long as I live, I will never forget what his eyes look like. They were the most beautiful electric blue that you can imagine. Again, an alive flame. So when I looked into his eyes, there were flames of electric blue that were dancing. And when he smiles, you die. His smile is so beautiful, there is no words for it. So not that veil is removed from your face. And you look into the face of your Lord, of your Father. I want you to imagine that brilliant white hair, beautiful electric blue eyes that say, I love you. I love you is what he says. I came up here in case Ryan was too drunk in the spirit to close out. <laughs> if any of you feel like you've had a release tonight from guilt, shame, and condemnation, I'd ask that you raise your hand and the rest of our body and believers freely. You've been given freely. Give minister to your brother and sister. And as we close out tonight, if you'd like to stay and continue worshiping, come up to the altar.